ठीक है Make sure my telephone's off. So, welcome to today's session where um, I'm going to try to give you an introduction to botanic gardens with a special focus on the University of Dundee's botanic garden, which I'm the curator of. My name is Kevin Frediani, and I'm really your host for today, but I'm also one of the partners in the Scottish Daffodil Project, which you are all members of. So, what I'm going to try to do is give you an overview of where botanic gardens have come from um, and how they fit in with the world around us, um, but then bringing it up to speed how botanic gardens are working today, because they are quite old institutions. You have to go back to the 16th century and look at the Renaissance movement that was beginning in Italy, this modern age of scientific discovery. And we see the first medical professors who are also professors of botany, because most of the plants that were then being grown within these institutions were being grown for medical purposes. And that was the beginning of this new science, moving away from a, a, a folk taxonomy of plants that were used based on the way that they looked or felt and the relationship to an organ or around the four humours of the body, which is something we can explore further in a, in a separate discussion, but moving towards a more, under, a more scientific understanding of classifying plants according to how they might be used and then analysing their um, internal um, working structures. So the first botanic garden we have in the world is in Pisa, 1543 to 1544, and that's a botanic garden with a professor of botany who was teaching medical sciences. The, the way these gardens were laid out was really inherited because uh, we'd, we'd actually been growing plants for medicinal purposes way before then. In fact, if you go back to the Egyptian times, you can see that there were already gardens being laid out just for medical reasons, even then. But most of what we would think of in terms of our formal construction of botanic gardens in that 16th century garden I shared just now come from um, the monasteries. And, uh, we had a monastery in Dundee from the 13th century, and although we don't know the layout of it because it was destroyed in, uh, in the 16th century and given by Mary Queen of Scots to the people of Dundee, who then turned it into a, um, a, a, a graveyard, which it still is today. So it's one of the main graveyards in Dundee. But we can have a pretty good approximation of what the garden would have looked like because the last of the Holy Roman Emperors, the um, uh, Charlemagne, um, who was a Frankish king, had many private homes and castles across Europe, but he also controlled or supported the control of many of the monasteries and what they looked like. And he put together a series of charters, which are known as capitularies. And in 18, 802, sorry, 802, not 1802, 802, he laid out a foundation of the plants that should be grown. And we see also the beginning of a layout being formed. And pretty well all the monasteries had a similar layout based on three things. Plants were grown for medicine to treat those people who were either visiting, who suffered in wars, or um, indeed the local populations. And, and Greyfriars Monastery in Dundee, the records show that it was actually a um, a, a, a monastic order that were supporting, providing lo local hospital services to the population in Dundee at that time. The other use we've got is food, food for both growing and feeding those who are in the monastery, visiting the monastery and surplus to the poor in the local areas. And the third is there is something called a cemetery orchard, which is both an orchard producing fruit, but it's also a place of contemplation of those that have died. And these um, these formats were um, rolled out across Europe. And in fact, there are two extinct examples, one in Switzerland and one in France today that you can st still visit that have this formal layout to them. The first botanic gardens in the UK we see are in the centres of primary education and research. So Oxford uh, had the first Botanic garden, originally a physic garden, and physic it pertains to medicine. So it was growing plants that were supporting people's um, health and well-being. But very quickly, as the world was opening up with the adventures over the seas, we saw plants 
being introduced from all around the then known world. My own experience of this comes from running Amsterdam Botanic Gardens, which was one of the oldest botanic gardens in the world. It was founded in 1638. It was originally a Hortus Medicus visit garden, and it very quickly became a centre, a repository from plants around the opening of the world, the Dutch East Indies and West Indies. And if you think about New York, it was originally called New Amsterdam, and there in New Jersey were were overseas territories of the Dutch who were bringing plants back from the opening of that um, Western colony. And we see the same in the East Indies with uh, one of the richest organisations that ever was established, um, uh, returning 17% on investment for over 200 years, which is just an incredible economic figure from plants being traded from the East Indies, which was... Um, uh, a, a really important area for the Dutch in terms of their overseas territories. And we see plants coming back from South Africa, like this Encephalatus cycad in the left, the pot plant growing there, which is believed to be the, one of the world's oldest pot plants, over 400 years old, that you can see in Amsterdam Botanic Garden today. But there's also this um, medical um, a publication by Johannes uh, Snippendal, the first um, curator, if you like, at Amsterdam Botanic Gardens that lists 300 plants. Um, and within 10 years, that's almost doubled with the number of plants being introduced from these overseas explorations. If I bring it back to um, sort of more smaller towns and cities around the country, because Oxford and London, Amsterdam and Pisa, these are important trading centres across Europe. But Dundee was quite a small uh, town, only 30,000 people in, in the seven, early, well, late late um, uh, uh, 17th and early 18th century. In 1706, we see Patrick Blair, a local apothecary who was making um, important tinctures and medicines and training to be a doctor, this is before doctors were known as, as terms. Back then you would have gone for surgery to your barber because they had the sharp implements and you would have been treated by apothecaries and um, and um, medical people, who which he would have been. But he was also a, a young scientist who was exploring anatomy of animals. For instance, he dissected the first Indian elephant that was found uh, to have died on the road out of Dundee towards Brotty Ferry. And he wrote to Sir Hans Sloan, not only with that publication, which was published in the Royal Society, which this project is linked to, but also um, wrote about the plants that he was growing in a physic garden where he was the overseer back in um, 1708. And uh, he talks about plants being exchanged with gardens in Leiden, in Amsterdam, in Pisa, Padua, but also at Chelsea Physic Garden. So you can see these exchanges of plants were already being traded because of their importance, but also because they were interesting, um, inquiring minds. Um, if I take that a stage further within Dundee, let's stay with this city. There was a, uh, we lost that garden. We don't know exactly where it was. We only know there was one because of Patrick Blair's writings, but we have another famous person, Patrick Geddes, who is um, famed with the phrase, um, act local, think global. He was the one, one of the first people to begin planning cities and he helped plan uh, Edinburgh away from slums into greener, softer built environments that supported well-being. And this was uh, back in 1898. He also looked, worked in Mumbai and in Montpellier and across not only Europe, but into Asia with his early um, uh, social sciences based around planning. But he was our first professor of botany and he argued and tried to raise funding for a botanic garden to be laid out in the west end of Dundee in a in a park not so far away from here called Magdalen Green. He even got paid money to do so, but it was never realised, unfortunately. And he eventually um, lost the use of his full sight. He stopped teaching botany and began touring the world, talking about landscape planning and having a huge influence, mainly in um, his actions in Europe and uh, in Asia, but also uh, his teachings in North America. Our first bot um, botanic garden as we know it today, though, was laid out in the site I sit in with you today. It used to be an old potato field and it had one sycamore that we see on the right. And there are two people, two important people to our history, 
on the left. Um, we've got Professor Draver, who was then the principal with his arms around his back, looking very non nonchantly as Eddie Kemp points into the future and envisages the landscape you see to here today, which we've got trees over 90 feet tall now growing here. So it shows you what you can do in a lifetime of planting. Indeed, the garden is laid out ecologically, so it's it's a really rare botanic garden. In fact, it's the only one I know of in the world that isn't laid out taxonomically. It's uh, at the west end of the city, but it also has an association with the main campus, which is just over a mile away, and with six other sites that we manage um, for the University of Dundee. And so I am curator of not only the botanic gardens and grounds, but also um, sports facilities and the like, um, which are becoming really Im important green spaces to provide the lungs of the city. So um, at this stage, I think it would be useful to talk about what a botanic garden is, because uh, they aren't just parks, they aren't just gardens growing beautiful plant place, um, plants. Um, but they are institutions which have a mission um, something that they're trying to do for greater good. And uh, T.C. Hone back in 2008 wrote a book, which is probably the standard reference, and he says there's something around acquiring plants, presenting them, but also conducting research and interpreting that so that the public can understand and enjoy uh, the cultural, scientific, historical, technical and natural history value of those plants. BGCI, which is the Botanic Gardens Conservation International, the, the leading governing body for botanic gardens that we're all registered with, say so they are plants, they are institutions that hold documented collections. And I think that's a really important part of it. Every single one of our living plants, but also our dead accessions from the past, have a record. We know where the plant came from. We know where in the world it was collected, when and who collected it. We also have a history of how it was growing. And it's that underpinning knowledge that supports our scientific research, but also the conservation of plants so that we can one day put them back and we can learn how to hybridize them and support, them, not hybridize, but pollinate them, um, share, share those genetic resources between the institutions to one day put back in terms of restoration ecology, but in the interim, display, interpret and share knowledge about them. There are many botanic gardens around the world. And in fact, the green dots are the botanic gardens on this world map, which focus on conservation, education and research as their three primary uh, reasons. But there are also research institutions and the red dots are these um, research uh, institutions that are around the world, mainly in bot bot uh, botanical hotspots that you might learn about in some of your classes, either geography or biology later on. It's interesting that there are more botanic gardens in Europe uh, because they were first started there and that's where the initial population of interest was. But there are the most, the youngest botanic gardens are in these biodiversity centers around the world. Our interest in those zones interestingly came from trading things like tobacco, uh, cotton and sugar, which underpin the first capitalization of the natural resources and the beginning of capitalization. There's a whole another subject there to look at the role of bot botanic gardens in supporting that um, Columbia exchange of plants and um, which now are, are um, associated with a, a deficit in nature. But back then we're just seen as a commodity to make money out of. So uh, what does a curator do? Many curators are looking after art galleries, aren't they? And so how can you curate a living collection? Well, coming back to the, the de definitions here laid out by the founding um, researcher, a guy called Hugh Ingram, and the pre previous curator to me when he first came, they wrote a book and in that book, uh, a guide to the garden and its purposes, they wrote the tradition of using the Botanic Garden to illustrate the A to, A's to Z, all the evolutionary relationships of those plants was never part of the policies of this garden. It was always designed as an ecological garden. Um, and most latterly, what I've done is included humans in that ecology. So uh, why is that? Well, botanic gardens have gone through quite a few changes over the years. And those historic gardens, the one that I used to manage in Amsterdam, for instance, had a palimpsest of layers of different uses from 
training apothecaries in the standard um, harvesting, growing, identification and preparation of tinctures and medicines, right the way through to the age of discovery and the cataloging of plants and the beginnings of classification, the scientific internal but also genetic interest in the research of university botanic gardens are coming right the way through to the last 50 years where we've been focusing on conservation of plants as two out of every five plants was um, focused with um, a conservation deficit, i.e. it would become extinct if we didn't do anything about it over the next um, 100 years. So important changes. We've, we've also got these other emerging existential crisis, we call them. These are, they're bigger than us, any individual can fix. So climate change, we've got the COP27 coming up and that's a big issue in the news you might hear about. Well, climate change with us means that we might be faced with less water or we might be faced with um, challenges around where crops are in, grown in the world and how they can be transported. But for plants that are static, if you if you haven't got an economic importance in the human world, then you could come become extinct. Um, uh, because plants can't move around without the aid of some sort of animal, wind agent or water, and they can't move quick enough with the rate of climate change. Again, that's maybe something you can pick up with your teachers in your classes over the coming year. Um, but you've also got mass population. When I was born, there was only 3 billion people on the planet. We've got now 8 billion. And by the time you get to my age, there'll probably be 10 billion people on the planet. That's a lot of people uh, when we need to feed them, house them, clothe them. Uh, uh, make sure there's medicines to look after them during their lives. Um, so you can see there's lots of demand upon those uh, natural resources. And many of us think that is unsustainable at the moment. So we need to balance that. So there is a conceptual basis for a modern botanic garden, something I've written about both in the Hortus Botanicus when I was trying to work out what was going on there. And I listed these historic and cultural or beautification amenity aspects of the garden alongside traditional education, conservation and science. But I flagged up that other word, sustainability, durability, and the Dutch called it durazam hide, which is hardening, interestingly, as, as a word. And it's how do we harden to these perturbations which could knock us off course, but come back and build a resilient future. So uh, these are some of the uh, objectives which modern botanic gardens that BGCI now talk about since 2018. Um, and I've been looking at how we embed them into our work here, to working with colleagues that you will hear about, people like Dr. Liz Lakin, um, with external groups like John, uh, who we're working with on the Scottish Daffodil Project, is could we establish the modern botanic garden as a living laboratory? That's what it is effectively, isn't it? But think of it not only as a natural resource laboratory, but also a social laboratory. And if we look at botanic gardens as the centre of our living laboratory and we use nature based solutions, i.e. plants, can we conserve biodiversity and engage people who are professionally engaged, but also the public and schools, groups like this, into supporting a more sustainable land use? What does that look like? Well, if I prototype it, that means practising, but at a small scale where I only use 10% of the resources or less. Um, we can learn to fail fast and if we succeed, I can evaluate it, I can write it up and I can share it and make a case to scale that at the university grounds that I look after. We can then provide a wellbeing campus and if that works, I can write it up again and share it with the professionals who look after the city landscapes within Dundee as part of a nature based solutions. And we've actually got funding from January the 1st to help Dundee become the first nature based solution city in the UK. What does that look like? I don't know, but I'll tell you in four years time. And uh, maybe some of you will be here studying alongside us and you can work out what that looks like. But um, we've actually got 38 partners from across Europe working with us to try to understand what that looks like using Geos, Copernicus, satellite data, mapping how much pollution each plant can potentially um, mop up how much water they can attenuate from the soil, but also how much carbon they can store. And we're learning from our living collections as part of this living lab and extending that across the city. If we get it right at Dundee, we can give hope to those cities across Scotland that can learn from us very quickly and globally we can act as a beacon for change. This is why science is exciting. It allows us to do 
all sorts of things that we didn't know was possible, but most importantly, it gives hope for the future because it's, a, it's an iterative process where we learn and we learn not only what works, but also what doesn't work. Talking of learning, uh, Dundee Botanic Garden had the first zero carbon, low energy building built in it in 2013. And that's the home of the living lab. So if you ever get to visit us, there's a library, the Les Bissett Library, named after one of the former curators who loved books and was a great plants person. Um, but it also has computers and a meeting room where students and researchers can come here and um, learn to fail fast and evaluate success so that we can better share it with other people uh, based around um, education for sustainability. It's meant to look a bit like a boulder rolling down the hill, but it sits in our Mediterranean ecological zone. So you can, um, you can see for yourself where it works, but it is a very beautiful building to be in. So where do these things look to plug into? Well, there are some emergent themes and you've probably heard about things like ecosystem services. Um, and there are four ecosystem services that people talk about and really you can change the word uh, provisioning services, very technical, and just think about food. You can look at regulating services and just say actually climate. Cultural services, how do we feel? The spiritual side of being well, um, rather than just the um, a physiological um, aspect of supporting well-being. And then we've got this uh, supporting services, nutrients from, from our food that look after us. Those, um, those aspects all still come from the way that we manage or allow natural landscapes to grow, develop and, put, um, and sustain ecologically themselves. And part of what we're trying to do now is learn how to uh, globally garden the world in a way that allows natural processes to function and those benefits, which is another way of saying ecosystem services, those benefits from nature can better sustain humans and the biodiversity that we want to see, not just survive, but thrive. There are lots of things we pull on from here. I talked about Patrick Geddes, the guy with the beard on the right hand side, but human ecology pulls from design. It also pulls from science. It pulls from the arts in terms of the writing and also from the history. So your future should you used to go down that line in a more human ecology way of thinking is much more holistic than the way I was trained when I was young. You were either trained in the arts or the sciences. You didn't realize they interlinked and they help us live life well. Um, again, reflecting on Dundee as a center for all of this work, why so good? Well, it's an interesting city because it was built on the on the on the economic foundations of jute, jam and journalism that all have plants somewhere in there. Jute is a plant that's uh, um, uh, grown in the uh, in India and it's uh, it used to be transported here and um, turned into jute bags and jute um, webbing and into sails that if you think before plastics it was a really important um, a wrapper around most of the commodities being traded around the world. Um, and it, it built um, wealth in Dundee, which made the most expensive street to buy buy houses in in the, in the 18th century was here, for instance. There were more Rolls Royces being sold in Dundee per capita than any other city in the world at one stage. It's not the same as that now. Uh, jam, sugar being brought in, uh, again, this isn't sugar that's grown from sugar beet, but it's sugar that was being grown in the Caribbean. And uh, that that's had all sorts of connotations associated with it, including the slave trade. So there's these links that go back through. Uh, and then journalism uses paper at the end of the day to create the newspapers that we read or used to read before the advent of the internet. Um, but, the, the, but the jute barons and the paper merchants and the publishers and the jam barons uh, bequeathed green spaces in Dundee for their um, employees to enjoy. In this industrial age where the air was thick with pollution because everything was being driven by coal. And um, these spaces were meant to be recreation spaces. And today they form the green lungs across the city. And per capita, there's more green space in this city than any other in the UK. Well, 
I talked about nature based solutions. Let's give a little bit of focus on that. What do I mean? Well, um, nature based solutions are encapsulated pieces of nature that existed or pre existed before the city was found. There are also things like those parks which were bequested by people or planned or grown just over time as buildings were knocked down or not built and, and greener spaces were created for recreation and enjoyment. And today they also include things like our urban street trees, our park trees, the green roofs, if you've heard of those and living walls. Together, these form the nature based solutions that can help our cities become more sustainable. So what does that look like? And here's a great example of a campus that has embraced those green infrastructure. And if it had water in it, there might be a pond there, but it was actually taking the rainwater off the green roof and any surplus was going into some sort of lake and water feature or seasonally dry ditch or swale, then it would be green and blue infrastructure. And that's the sort of thing that we're working towards on Dundee's campus as we turn it from a very hard architecture soften it through plants and water to create a well-being campus. We're also though not just working on our own sites, we're working over the garden wall. The main project we've got here that does that is something called Rewilding Dundee, where we work with partners across the city to help create biodiverse, not just green spaces. And here is a group of children who are each pretending they're, they're a tree and today Actually, in between that picture and today, they helped me plant a wee forest, which is creating a little bit local nearby nature next to the uh, medical centre, which is used as an outdoor surgery now. But it's also next to the primary school, which is their outdoor classroom. And we've been doing that together. And, and now artists are coming in and helping storytell or mosaic make. And we've got this outdoor space in the heart of the city, which was just somewhere where dogs used to walk, is now being used as an outdoor classroom and community space. We, um, we grow things like sunflowers and give them away each year and we encourage people without gardens to grow on their windowsill plants that can help pollinators and we say if you have got a garden maybe stop thinking about mowing it, putting in a border with wildflowers as well as um, exotic and if you do grow exotic plants think about those ones which are singles rather than doubles that still have the extra floral nectaries that will help these pollinating insects. Um, a whole series of things going on from creating spaces, but also monitoring what's going on. And we're using smart technology. We've got a bird net pie, for instance, in the garden that tells us not only what birds have we got here, but how many times they're seen and what time in the day they're seen and how which direction they're traveling in. And that's just a hundred pound computer that sits in one of our buildings with a little microphone and it sends signals out um, live streaming, telling us what's going on in the we do the same for bats and we also do moth monitoring and bio blitz every year. Here's that wee forest being planted and there's me in the right in a woodland that was planted here the same size as what these children have planted in the botanic garden as an example as part of one of our eight Tayside habitats that were laid out as this ecological garden 50 years ago. We're also developing a food work across the city and we've helped form an organisation called Sustainable Food Places Dundee, which looks at how we might grow more food within our city and the, that food that is grown, how we can make sure that we share it more fairer and equitably. Can we encourage people to think about farmers markets again in our city and we support a community supported agriculture on our periphery that those farmers that currently grow food for su su um, global supply chains might think about growing for the local consumers in the city. The big issues we're trying to cover are things like catering and procurement because the university, the council and all the schools at the moment are locked into buying programmes that buy cheap from anywhere in the world rather than buy local and support local businesses and local people. But we think if we can do all of that, it'll be fitter for the planet and it'll be better for those people. So thinking a little bit more about where our food comes from. We're working with research artists and we've got two PhD students here who are helping us engage through the emotional connection that imbues um, a, a connection between the plants that we grow and the people and communities associated with them. And Desiri Corral on the right hand side there is one of our research artists in residence who's studying the material culture of colour. Why is that significant and how can she bring that forward? Well, 
colour is something we don't really think about that material value of, but she uses the plant Bixa orellana, which comes from her home country in Ecuador. It's given a Latin name by Linnaeus that, that celebrates the conquistadors that brought disease, pestilence and war to her country and decimated that population in the um, in the 15th and 16th century. So here we are celebrating those conquistadors with a Latinized name. And yet that plant, which is called Bixorolata, also known as a lipstick tree, is the most ubiquitous food colour in the world today. And yet no one knows where it comes from or its original origin. And the fact that we see it as a plant that's everywhere in the Amazon rainforest, whereas the indigenous cultures, it was the first plant they planted when they got to a clearing. So it even challenges our understanding of the ecology and the role of humans in those wild areas like the Amazon rainforest, which we now should see better as forest gardens for indigenous people. And on the left, we've got a, a research artist called Hamer Dodds, who looks at using art to challenge scientists to think differently about the way that they see problems and overcome them by thinking about design and thinking about questions which will take them outside of their narrow way of looking at a reductive science. More on that to follow over the coming years. We put in a physic garden right outside our life sciences where they develop some of the world's new drugs from plants still today. Indeed, 30% um, of the world's new drugs are still derived from plants in the wild. Um, and increasingly, we're beginning to put growing systems in place to bulk up rather than synthesize plants as we realize there is a synergy in feeding our holobiont rather than treating the symptom because we have got more bacteria and archaea in our stomachs than we have cells in our body. So understanding the whole system isn't about trying to kill off those bacteria in our stomach, it's about learning how to live with them better and plants do it because they've evolved with us far better than the synthetic drug does. But that's another thing to pick up with your, your uh, uh, teachers. We've got an art gallery to allow us to make connections um, in visual, visual ways that also help people think about the garden in a creative way as a, as a design space. And um, we've even got the world's first COVID memorial garden, a space that imbues emotion and helps people remember those they lost during that first year of lockdown where we were all only allowed out for an hour a day and many of us missed those loved ones that we would have liked to have witnessed um, uh, being um, going to rest. And uh, through four seasons and four hagstones that are two metres high, we've got spring, summer, autumn and winter captured forever in a garden that's becoming at the heart of the botanical. They are a garden that helps us celebrate good life, good death and good grief, because it's a process we all have to learn with to be resilient in um, in our own lives. Something I hope you don't experience too soon, but sooner or later we all do. Um, and the more we realise that we're better coming through that together, being part of something bigger than ourselves, the easier that will be. Um, we've done an awful lot with play. With things like fairy doors, outdoor playing and inclusive family play within the garden over the course of the last two years, feeding on from COVID where we learned that there was a whole group of people we weren't engaging with but we could do better um, and that's a new area of, of research and interest, knowledge generation and teaching that's coming to us and we've got this project, the, um, the school engagement project which now helps you work in just the same way as our scientists do at the Division of Plant Science and James Hunt Institute, where we um, look at using techniques that are going on to support some of the big challenges around food security and understanding the genetics of plants and how we can help those plants become more resilient or overcome salinity in soils. And uh, you're helping us use the same techniques to understand some of the cultural unknowns around where our daffodil parentage came from using phylogenies. It's the act of participating, you following the processes that will help you explore the world that's going on alongside us, parallel to us, helping feed 10 billion people that's important. Not necessarily the end result, but at the end of it, I can assure you, you will be working at the same level as PhD students and PIs using techniques that most people don't get to, to use until the third or fourth year of their degree. So well done for stepping into that. 
Uh, we've already had a great year um, and uh, many of your teachers would have seen this, the outcomes of that um, within the classroom or shared as part of joining this program. This is the sign that's in the Botanic Garden today that greets all of our visitors and the QR code takes them to websites that shows them that work that's gone on to find out about the um, relationships of the daffodils that we've been cultivating. Heritage varieties that had a sort of stud book telling the parentage, but we've been able to check it and take um, a project where at the beginning there was only three partially sequenced um, chloroplast DNAs for daffodils and now I think there will be another six added to that because of the school project. So again, great thing to uh, realise you're actually contributing to the body of science. Talking of science and making it relevant to our visitors, last year we saw not only one storm, but we saw uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven storms within two months, November the 25th through to the 20th of February, so 2021 to 2022. And uh, they, they blew down 45 trees in our garden, something we'd not seen before. These were jet storms. Uh, jet storms are really interesting because we have these, uh, um, this is where the cold air uh, meets uh, warm air, but not in a normal way, where the jet stream that's traveling around in a sort of sequence above us all the time is suddenly met with this incoming, very dry intrusion from the south. And it causes this particular formation, cloud formation with a center to it, the eye of the storm that you see on the left. It's, uh, it, it occurs in four sequential steps and they are laid out in this groundwork that you see where we took the trees and the upturned stumps and we turned them into a, a land art called cyclogenesis together with this research artist on the right from Boulder, Colorado, who's usually a furniture maker and an external artist working on landform. So I asked to do this landscape scale piece to help us, our visitors realize that we all have to uh, get used to not clearing away the debris from these storms, but learning to live with it. And what better way to do that than to create a land, a piece of land art that you can actually walk through and enjoy, but also reflect on the impact of more energy being put into the atmosphere. It's got to come out somewhere. What does that look like? More frequent, more violent storms, more episodic weather. But we also use that deadwood to help us create something very different than just the normal plant collection display. But it's a life in deadwood trail deadwood habitat trail it's an outdoor storytelling area there's a throne with my superman son sat in it laughing at me as i try to tell him that that will be a place where important stories are told in the future on the right hand side there is a deadwood pile that children can climb through climb over supported by their parents but also our undergraduate students can pick through it as they look for those incoming insects and the succession of species, but also the decay fungi as it rots. And then we've got dead standing, dead lying, and even a pine saw fly um, crypt. All of these things are important ecological um, ex exhibition areas that allow us to engage with our students, and but also with our visitors as we create nature trails in this beautiful habitat. And I guess, the last thing I'll share with you, one of the last things, is how we are turning our lawns that used to be mown 27 times a year into wildflower meadows. And we're using yellow rattle to do that, start this ecological succession step. It's uh, allowing us to move away from a site that used to use more carbon to maintain it through the tractors mowing it than it did storing in the trees that were growing, even though there's 25,000 tonnes worth of carbon on our uh, 27 acre or 9.5 hectare site. Um, just by stopping that mowing, we've allowed the roots to go deeper with the grass meadows, store more carbon, increase the biodiversity in our wildflower meadows, improve the pollinators and moss and then because of the food chain that the insects go up the wildlife associated with predating on them the birds and the bats so that we are seeing more biodiversity coming into the garden and being enjoyed just by a simple act of meadow making so for now i'm gonna have to leave it at that and ultimately the true value of the work that we do is going to be something that you judge me on in the future but I hope that's given you a sort of an overview and an interest into botanic gardens that you might thought were just boring institutions with plants laid out A to Z. They are so much more. And in a way, I hope they become part of your future. Thank you.
what I'll do now is open the open it up to any of you for questions if you've got them. I know that time is tight, but I've tried to be quite stick to my time frame. So if there's anything you've got, please do do that. If not, you can ask them through your teachers and we can um, pick them up at a later date. See if there's any questions that come up there. You can either type them or say them, but if you say them, just turn off your um, or turn on your microphone. Thank you, Kevin. It's Jack here. Um, yeah, sorry, the camera doesn't extend as far as me, I'm afraid, but yeah, it's been really, really useful to have the talk. Thank you so much. Um, you've actually answered some of our questions as you've gone along. It's been, you've covered a lot of ground, so that's been useful. Thank you. Um, I don't think we we have many more questions, um, but but yeah, we just wanted to say thank you from Berkshire. Thank you, Berkshire. And thank you, Jack, and everyone there. I hope to see you all in the flesh at some point soon, if not on my travels through. I used to look after Windsor Great Park, so I know you're part of the world very well. And um, I used to be with secretary of the local Arboricultural Association, the tree people in that part of the world and the Institute of Horticulture. So, so many colleagues down there still today. So you never know. I might get along with it. So you, oh, see you in the flesh one day. eh? Yeah, you're always welcome here. Excellent. I think if there's no. If there's no more questions. What we can do is give you your time back. Um, but this transcript will be available afterwards, so anyone who's missed it, they can watch it. And I'm always happy if you uh, if you want to frame some questions through your teachers and they can raise them with us, I'm happy to do that. And again, if anyone's ever interested in it and you're studying something else alongside the biology and you wanted to pick it up in history or English or, um, well, economics, anything like that, then uh, I, I'll always try to segue you to someone either a colleague or a, a, a really good reference that will help explain more on that subject. Um, I hope that's of use. OK, I'll stop the recording now.